Hello, everyone. Welcome to a, a new Net Zero Watch webinar. We're delighted that you're all uh, here to join us this afternoon. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about prospects for commercial nuclear fusion power plants. And we've got uh, three excellent panelists who are going to be talking uh, to us about this this afternoon. I'm going to introduce them each uh, in turn, and we'll be hearing from them, hearing their presentations uh, from them in turn. And then we'll be asking you to submit your questions uh, as we hear from them. And we're going to have an open Q&A discussion uh, after we've heard from each speaker. So please do submit those. You should see on the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Please uh, use that to submit your questions over the course of this webinar. And I'll be choosing from them uh, later uh, and we'll be having a discussion based around those questions. So without further ado, I'll invite, I'll uh, welcome our first uh, guest panelist, which is uh, John Carr. Uh, John followed an academic research career in particle physics and uh, astro astroparticle physics with positions at Imperial College, Rutherford Laboratory, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, the University of Co Colorado, uh, and the Centre de Physique des Particules de Marseille. And he was responsible for the construction of the Antares Neutrino Telescope, which was operational at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea near Toulon, uh, from 2006 to 2021. And he authors the website climateandhope.net. That's climate with a hyphenated and hope.net. And, and you should really check out that as well if you want to do further uh, reading after this um, webinar. We are also delighted that he published a, a recent report for our sister organization, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, Nuclear Fusion, Should We Bother? Uh, and again, that's excellent further reading uh, if you want to explore this topic in more detail uh, after today. Uh, so, John, without uh, further ado, uh, please uh, give your presentation. Okay, so I'm here. So uh, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, could you confirm that that works? Yes, that's that. We can all see that. Okay, it's not full screen yet. Okay. So these are the three presentations. So I'm starting off and then uh, Michelle and Clive will, will give talks with these titles. So my talk is basically comparing nuclear fusion with nuclear fission. I'm gonna uh, relate a few myths about the advantages of fusion compared to fission. And I hope I'll be able to convince you that uh, in reality, there are no significant advantages of, of fusion. The research towards nuclear fusion has been in progress for about 75 years now. And as yet, there's been zero electricity produced with uh, fusion. Whereas in contrast, uh, nuclear fission, which started on the same time scale, the same physics was invented at the same time, basically, uh, the first fis fission reactor to be connected to the grid was at Calder Hall in uh, the UK in 1956. And now fission represents about 10% of the world's electricity produced. And so the theme of my talk and the theme of this, uh, this paper, which uh, Harry referred to, was why bother with fusion when we have all these good things already coming out of fission. And so what I'm gonna focus on is uh, what I call mainstream fusion, which has been the main activity of fusion research since the 1980s, which is a tokamax with the fuel of deuterium tritium. Recently, there's been a very interesting development of private fusion companies. So there's sort of an evolution from public funding of all this stuff to private funding. This is a very interesting development, but in this presentation, I, I don't have time to do anything except just mention it. Okay, so I'm gonna dive in. What's necessary to get this point across 
uh, I'm making is to go into a bit of the technology and the physics. Without it, it's basically impossible to fully understand. So this, this first transparency is comparing the nuclear physics of fission and fusion. And so fission is the splitting of a uranium, maybe one day different other elements like thorium, with an incoming neutron, which splits into two fission products and gives out energy. And uh, the, the vital thing about fission is that although uh, the continuing chain reaction is propagated with neutrons given out from an earlier fission splitting, the reaction starts spontaneously. In contrast, fusion, which is the coming together of deuterium and tritium nuclei, these are heavy isotopes of hydrogen, these reactions need a very high initial temperature to initiate the reaction, to bring, to overcome the Coulomb forces and bring the two nuclei together so they can fuse. And with these two elements, you get in the, the final state, you get helium and neutrons, one, one neutron, uh, plus energy. Now, the first myth about fusion is that it's actually the energy, the, the electricity generating mechanism, which has the, the highest energy density. From this picture, if you just count the number of protons and neutrons, then this is actually strictly true. Fusion does have the highest energy density per nucleon or per mass, where mass and energy are equivalent in this. Where the re reality in, in the actual generation of electricity is that the media these two reactions take place in is very, very different and has very, very different density. Fission takes place in the solid, in the fuel rods inside a reactor core, whereas fusion takes place in a low density gas, actually called a plasma, uh, such that fission has very much higher energy density per unit volume. So the mass story is a complete myth. And the fact that the energy density is much higher in terms of volume in fission means that fusion reactors must be very much larger than uh, fission reactors for the same electricity output. And the size is cost. And so this is gonna be a major point of what my presentation is gonna try and get across. So very quickly, how does this technology work? So I'm focusing on one fusion technology, which is the main one, uh, which is magnetic confinement fusion. So as I've already said, this fusion takes place in a plasma at greater than 2 million, 200 million degrees centigrade. So fusion plasma is referred to often as the fourth state of matter. These cartoons sort of explains that a plasma has the, the electron stripped off the atom, and so you're left with the, the nucleus of the atom, or ion is a different way to say it, and it's the ions of deuterium and tritium which fuse. Now, this magnetic confinement sets up complicated configurations of magnetic fields, and these two little uh, cartoons here illustrate that, that in a magnetic field, the iron spirals round, it's trapped around the length of a magnetic field. And in these devices that we're talking about today, the magnetic field lines loop round in a donut. And so that the, the ions and also the electrons just spiral round and round and they're trapped. And that's the, the beauty of this system, but uh, it's one of the big costs of this system. And so this requires in these devices very complex, very expensive, and in the latest uh, devices we're going to talk about, superconducting magnets to contain the plasma. And these things, the superconducting magnets 
cost a lot. So they're, the, the magnets are a very significant fraction, like 40% of the cost of one of these devices. So uh, the main, the biggest types of, of these, these reactors, which are, uh, we, we're going to focus, the, the whole research field is focused on a particular type of donut called a tokamak. Uh, the name is Russian. These things were invented in Russia. And the biggest operational tokamak was operating in Oxfordshire Cullum until December last year. Uh, it's called Joint European Tourist Jet. And uh, Clive will tell you a bit about this. Uh, after JET, the next stage in this uh, theme of fusion research is this International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER, which is in the south of France in Provence, which has been in construction in 2010. So Michel will tell you about that. So I'm going to, the rest of the talk is telling you why fusion is so uh, expensive, basically. So a very essential feature of any of these devices is how you get the power out. And it turns out in some of these devices, it's far from simple. And in some of these private company devices, it's even not obvious how it's actually going to work. Uh, and this is distinct from how it happens in fission. Uh, at a very basic level. So a mainstream fusion reactor generates the electricity in the same way from cooling water, which goes through a heat exchanger and makes steam, and the steam drives a steam turbine. But how this water gets heated is very different in the two systems. In fission, the core is a few hundred, less than a thousand degrees, and the water just circulates through in between the fuel rods and very easily picks up the heat and takes it outside. This is not the case in the, the fusion reactor because the plasma is at this two million degrees C, and so there's no way you can circulate water in this inside this plasma. So what has to happen is the, all the energy or the power has to come out and this power gets transferred to water in an outside volume, which is called the breeder blanket. We don't have time to go into all the interests of this breeder blanket. We'll come back to it in, in a bit, but this is very different. And what it means is that the heat exchange takes place in the volume in fission but on the surface of the reactor for fusion. And this means uh, a very important fact that the, the allowable heat through this first wall, which is the interface between the plasma and this, this water cooling system is actually the limitation of fusion output power. And there's just no way around that. That defines the size of everything. So this transparency tries to get this across in a very simple way. And so what this transparency is, it's, it assumes that the, uh, the tokamak is a simple torus. And uh, what do we have on this line, on this curve, is a plot of the output electricity from the tokamak in megawatts against the torus outer radius in meters. And then we have three curves for three different values of the allowable heat flux, the heat flow through this first wall. So the green curve is uh, one megawatt per square meter, which is like standing behind a jet engine. And this is the heat load, which uh, is planned, which actually is planned for the heat air design and it's planned for uh, this follow-up to heat air, which is called DEMO, uh, which is a prototype power reactor. Heat air, as uh, Michel explained, doesn't plan to make any electricity. The follow-up device is, 
is much bigger, 1.5 times linear dimension bigger. It's called DEMO, and it does plan to produce electricity. So with this heat flux, then uh, just taking the surface area of the donut, you immediately get to the power output of uh, 500 megawatts electricity. There's a, there's a conversion factor for fusion power to electricity gone in this. And that's it. One of these private fusion companies, this other red dot marked arc is uh, down here if the pointer works. So this is demo, this is arc. So on this blue curve, so this private fusion company plans to allow a much higher heat flux through its first wall. It also has higher magnetic fields to make the thing smaller, but it's actually the, this power through the wall is the limitation. And so this is down here, it's a smaller device, uh, outer radius of the torus about 4.5 rather than 12, uh, but it, it only has 200 megawatts output. So uh, these private companies make a lot of fuss about how they're making things smaller, but a major way they're making these things smaller is by making them have smaller, lower electricity output. And given that the point is to make electricity, that's, uh, if you don't read the small print on the advertisement, that's a bit of a swiss. Okay, so then to compare to these fusion, these two fusion power plants, which are planned, then the, the dash dotted line way up at the top uh, is uh, the new EDF fission reactor EPR2, which are going to start being built in the north of France starting this year. Okay, and this, in, in the fusion world, nobody talks, or very few people dream of getting anything which is anywhere near uh, the latest EPR2 fission reactor. To do that, you would have to go to very high fluxes through this first wall. If any people want to ask questions about how this might be possible, then we can we can go into that at the end. Okay, so this is uh, just a graphical illustration of all this uh, cartoons, which show uh, to get more power out, uh, you have to make this thing bigger and bigger. And then in the end, we're comparing what would have to be the scale of a one gigawatt fusion reactor with this mainstream technology. So this, the plasma is in the middle inside this, this yellow thing. This is the, the vacuum vessel. And all the purple and blue are the magnets. And so this thing, including the magnets, is about 45 meters across to produce one gigawatt of electricity. Whereas the equivalent fission reactor, uh, pressurized water reactor is only five meters across, vastly smaller. And in many publications, this volume of what they call highly engineered reactor components is what is used to define a relative cost. And so on this measure, fusion reactors will ne inevitably be vastly more costly than fission reactors. So here, the, the, those things were just cartoons to give you an illustration. These two pictures are actual uh, designs of real plants. So on the right, there are the, this is the EPR2 reactor, uh, 1,650 megawatts. Uh, the plan in France is to build 14 of these going into operation between 2035 and 2050. And the first one is actually starting uh, construction this year in Penley in the north of France. Uh, this demo reactor, it is a Eurofusion, there's a EU design project, which has designed this over the past few years. And this is what they've come up with. Uh, so in the, both have containment vessels. And an important point about this is fusion is not free of radioactivity issues. Uh, so the containment vessel for demo is slightly bigger 
than that of an EPR2 reactor, but the power is down by more than a factor three. And so uh, very soon, uh, these enormous fission reactors are going to go into operate, they're going to go into construction, will be operating in, in a couple of decades, whereas the time scale uh, for this demo fusion prototype reactor, fusion power plant, uh, is very uncertain, but it's very unlikely to be operational before 2060 and more realistically, maybe 2080. So that's basically showing that these things are going to be enormous and enormous means costly. So if that isn't enough to convince mm -hmm. you that they're, they're enormously expensive, I've just got three transparencies with cartoons to show you even more of how complex these things are. So the cartoon we've actually already seen for the, the water coming out from the breeder blanket. But this the same cartoon shows you that to, to heat this plasma up to this 200 million degrees, you now have to have a lot of power going in. And so ETA is going to have all sorts of different power input systems. They're going to try and choose which is the most efficient. Uh, but the, the whole system uh, has, it has these magnets, which uh, they're, they, they're superconducting, but the cryogenics needs a lot of power. There's also lots of other plant. And so any fusion power plant has to calculate its net power gain. You've probably seen these sort of calculations done in one way or another already. But you you, you have to get the a net power gain. The power out is, is greater than the, all the, the sum of the power in. And this is a definitely long way from obvious in some devices. Uh, so another complexity is the tritium fuel supply. This is a very complicated issue, but this fuel of tritium is not uh, available in nature. It's very scarce in rate nature, and it actually only sources of tritium are from actual fission reactors at the time being. But a big problem with tritium is it's radioactive with a 12-year lifetime, so anything you make decays relatively rapidly. So yeah, you have to have uh, fuel, tritium fuel to start this thing up. But once it's operating, the plan is to regenerate tritium in this system we've already mentioned around the plasma, which is a regeneration blanket. So this, how this happens is very complicated. And then uh, the, the tritium you get out has to go through purification system and it has to be re-injected in. And uh, nobody has ever tested a real regeneration system in a, a breeder blanket for a number of reasons. Uh, all this has to be developed. So this is one reason why the timescale is going to be long on this. There's still, even after the plasma contains itself in the, the tokamak, there's a lot of engineering to do. So uh, the next complication with this fusion is the there is another myth about fusion reactors is that they uh, don't produce radioactivity. This is totally false. We've we've seen on the second transparency uh, this reaction produces neutrons, high energy neutrons, and these neutrons do a lot of damage. They produce by neutron activation, they produce radioactive isotopes. They also damage uh, all the metals, all the steels. And because the metals get damaged by the neutrons, many components have to be frequently uh, replaced. I mean, the, the frequency depends on exactly how close they are to the plasma, but it's uh, in this demo design, it's between two and four years. And these are very complex operations. The, the tokamak can't be opened. It's all welded together. 
And so any all these things have to come out of the top. So this is this shows you uh, one of the breeder blanket sectors coming out through a hole at the top of the tokamak uh, with what's uh, indicated in green here. But in, in practice, this is a phenomenally complicated remote handling system. And then once they're out, they have to go through some railway to no, nowhere near any personnel to a remote handling building where they're, they're, they're recycled and put back in some years later. Uh, so that uh, contributes to what is one of the real problem with these de devices, uh, which a professor at UCLA has called the Achilles heel of fusion. It's the, the actual reactor availability or capacity factor, which is equivalent to other power systems. So this, this is likely to be very low because both this... Uh, extensive maintenance where the whole thing has to be down. In addition, it's got all these complicated systems, complicated systems break. And so the capacity factors likely to be about 30% for all these things. And this, this comes into the cost of electricity, which is not often advertised. Okay, so this, we're getting towards the end. Uh, I have uh, this summary table uh, I'll leave you to read this, some of the things I've already said, but uh, we've just gone through this line here, which is availability, uh, reliability greater than 85% for reactors. This is a number in France, in some other countries uh, like the US, they're more reliable than this. But fusion's like 30%. And then the relative cost per megawatt hour constructed I put for fusion, and it's likely to be uh, at least a factor 10 more. Uh, this is a long story to explain. I've given you some reasons. There are actually more which I haven't given. Fuel availability is a myth, which is obviously often pushed for fusion. Uranium's abundant, but tritium's very scarce. And you might be able to make it once you've got the thing started, the fusion reactor started. But if you're starting up a, a fusion reactor, you have to get it from somewhere. And that's uh, that's a long story. And then uh, we, we haven't got time to go into it this in any way, in any detail, but uh, the, the, the radioactivity is different. In fission, it's uh, only partly long-lived. Uh, a lot of it's very short-lived. Uh, or sorry, uh, in fission is, is partly long-lived. This is the, the, the spent fuel. Uh, part of the reactor also gets irradiated with neutrons. Uh, but the fusion reactor doesn't have any very long-life things, but it has, it has uh, radioactivity, which needs careful handling for hundreds, even thousands of years. Safety is, is a big uh, myth, or it's a big advantage stated for fusion over fission. Uh, fission's big bugbear is these well-known historic accidents, but uh, fusion in reality has many complex systems, has hydrogen, there are risks of hydrogen explosions. So what actually went bang at... Uh, Chernobyl and also Fukushima was hydrogen, not uh, not the the reactor, and so uh, th there's a certain tendency to try to avoid fusion reactors, fusion power plants having to go through the same nuclear regulator system as fission. But this, I in my mind, is a is a major problem, I and mean, it's a major. There are risks, and trying to ignore them is really uh, a big risk for the future for everything. Okay, so my bottom line is that fusion has no advantage over fission and fission is vastly less expensive. And so these are my personal conclusions. Repeat, fusion has no advantages. I don't believe that a one gigawatt mainstream tokamak will ever be built. It's just too big and expensive. 
these private fusion companies, which have started off in the last couple of decades, have very interesting ideas. But if you read the small plinth, they're talking about relatively small sizes, never uh, going to be in competition with a big fission reactor, more in competition with small modular reactors. These private companies are very optimistic about time scales, but I, I, I definitely believe that they give time scales for commercial fusion in the, the early 2030s, but I, I definitely believe this is not realistic. My bottom line conclusion is that at best commercial fusion plants will be available in the next century. And if we ever get uh, fission, fusion connected to the grid, it will be more than a century later than fission was first connected in to the grid uh, with uh, Alder Hall. Okay, so that's my presentation. Uh, I guess we're gonna take questions at the end. Thank you very much, John. Lots to uh, reflect on there. And I'm sure we'll come back to uh, those uh, topics very shortly. Uh, so, but, but let's uh, press on with our next speaker. I'm conscious we want to fit in many uh, questions at the end. So uh, I'll just introduce him. Michel Clessons is a scientist and essayist. He was the head of communications and external relations um, at uh, the ETER project, which John was telling us about uh, just a moment ago. And his background is in physical chemistry and science journalism. He joined the European Commission in 1994, where he's been acting head of communication unit in the research directorate general and spokesperson for the uh, Research EU magazine. Uh, and he also teaches at the Free University uh, of Brussels. And I should mention that he's just published uh, his the second edition of his book, uh, ITER, the giant fusion reactor, uh, which is the most sort of up-to-date account uh, of that project. So do do read that as well uh, if you can. So uh, Michel Clessons, uh, I'll hand things over to you and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Oh, <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you, Harry, and thank you, John, also, for having invited me to this uh, webinar. Is the sound okay? Yeah, so I will um, try to share my screen. Um, voilà. Okay. Um, so hello to everyone. I'm very happy to be uh, taking part in this interesting discussion. Uh, I will present uh, briefly the ITER project uh, as uh, John uh, introduced it as a, a good example of a project trying to make the link between the two photographs on this slide. On the left side, uh, the reactions occurring in the sun, and on the right side, uh, a fusion power plant. Um, ITER is a fantastic experiment. Mm -hmm. And I show you here the, the final uh, sketch uh, of uh, the, uh, the plant. Uh, in Cadarache in France, so we are in Provence, uh, 40 kilometers from uh, Aix-en-Provence, 80 kilometers from Marseille. And this is uh, a recent uh, view of the, the, the site. Uh, the two main buildings, the two high buildings in the center are hosting uh, the assembly uh, equipments on the left side. And the building on the right side is uh, hosting the, the future reactor. The site, as you can see, is still in construction. Uh, there are cranes there. There are 38 buildings uh, that have been uh, constructed uh, since 2007. 
and um, voila, the construction is still progressing. This is a, a computerized computerized sketch of the ITER uh, tokamak. Uh, it's about 30 meters high uh, and 30 meters large. There is you know, on the bottom of the picture there uh, a little man, uh, which gives you an idea of the scale of the machine with the, the main cavity in the center uh, where the fusion reactions will occur. This cavity will be huge, it's still in uh, uh, the assembly phase, uh, since the volume of this cavity is 850 cubic meters. So uh, you can consider that it is a three story little building. Uh, so it's a huge, huge space that will be filled. Uh, with the fuel that is a mixture of deuterium and tritium, but only one or two grams of gas will be injected in the cavity when the machine will operate. Because these reactions are, as we say in science, very exothermic. So they, they, they liberate, they produce a lot of energy. You don't, you don't need a lot of matter, so a lot of fuel, you see to get a, a megawatt of power. The idea of ITER is already quite old because it was put forward uh, in Geneva in November 1985 when the president, the American president, uh, Ronald Reagan, met for the first time Mikhail Gorbachev the Secretary General of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And the, the, the final press release of this meeting had 13 points, mainly on the, the control of uh, uh, nuclear weapons. But the, the last point was uh, on having uh, an international cooperation to uh, progress uh, on fusion energy. So this was the starting point after a lot of years uh, and the first design of the machine, um, the, the members uh, of ITER, because this is an international cooperation, there are seven members taking part in the experiment and funding the project. Um, and at the end, <clears throat> the members after three years of political, diplomatic, and technical discussions, the members decided to uh, build ITER in France, in the south of France. Um, <clears throat> after that, uh, an international uh, agreement was signed uh, in Palais de l'Elysée with the president, the French president, Chirac at that time. Then the work could uh, really start. And uh, the first step was to uh, level uh, the ground there and to make this huge platform. The local people here uh, say that this is the, the biggest boulodrome to uh, play pétanque in the world. So it's a platform of 42 hectares, about uh, 20 uh, football uh, grounds. That, uh, that will host the 38 buildings of uh, ITER. The complexity of the project uh, comes also from the fact, well, of course, it's a first of a kind uh, machine, uh, although there are about 100 tokamaks in operation or in project in the world. ITER will be the biggest one, about 10 times the volume, the volume of jet. But one of the, uh, the big complexities of this project is the fact that the seven me members, that is in total 35 countries, uh, because uh, there is the European Union uh, as a member, 
So 35 countries are sharing the manufacturing, the construction, etc. So this is uh, this makes the project extremely complex because all these components coming from Japan, from China, etc., have to match uh, to, to, together. Uh, so it makes uh, the, the project very complex, very challenging. And it's not just building the, the, the tokamak, which you have seen. Uh, it's also putting around all the technical systems to provide the, the electricity, the liquid helium, uh, removing the waste, etc. So um, it's a gigantic uh, puzzle of high technology. And as I said, this is made even more complex by the fact that uh, all the, the members are taking part, an active, taking an active role in the, the manufacturing and the construction. So, if there is a problem somewhere in one country, for example, where there was the, the, the Fukushima accident in Japan, most Japanese uh, companies were closed at least for some months. So it can uh, <clears throat> slow down the whole process. But things are moving forward, hopefully. And uh, this is the first superconducting magnet that has been uh, made in China in 2019 and that has been sent since to Kadarash in France. And uh, this was the, the cryostat base, so in a way the, the, base, the base of the, the tokamak that has been moved into the, the, the Tokamak pit in May 2020, uh, starting officially the, the assembly of the reactor. However, there have been some recent difficulties uh, because um, the ASN, so the Autorité de, de Sûreté Nucléaire, so this is the French nuclear regulator, which controls all, all the, the ITER side, uh, especially on the nuclear aspects, um, has decided not to uh, has decided not to remove the holding point uh, put in 2013 on the assembly. Because and they expect they explain this in a public letter, they are they, they've uh, identified defects on the vacuum vessel sectors coming from Korea. The ASN is not satisfied with the pro biological protection, so that is the protection of the workers and the public against uh, nuclear uh, radiation. They have some doubts about the solidity of the concrete slab that uh, will support three buildings, three nuclear buildings, including the Tokamak building. And they ask also to uh, a complete check of the reactor design. So it's a huge um, request coming from uh, ISN. And since then, uh, further problems have been identified, uh, in particular uh, cracks um, in the piping of the vacuum vessel thermal shield, which led the ITER organization to decide to remove all the pipes. So it's uh, nearly 30 kilometers in total and to uh, remanufacture uh, these pipes which should be finalized um, early 2025 or 2026. And um, as also John um, said, um, there are technical challenges uh, in the fusion world uh, concerning in particular the, the fuel and uh, the source of tritium huh? as uh, there is only uh, 30 kilos of tritium 
worldwide, uh, worldwide today. So it is uh, estimated that with two projects like ITER, you will consume all the, the inventory of tritium. We still have, uh, we still are missing a, a, a good material for the first wall of the Tokamax. We have a solution for it there, but it's not a, a, a long-term uh, uh, sustainable solution. And there are still questions about the economic feasibility. Okay. Uh, regarding now the prospects for uh, commercial plants, uh, just know that ITER will not produce any electricity. Huh? Uh, ITER is an experimental reactor. Uh, the aim is to show uh, indeed that we, we master the technology uh, and that the machine will work and produce fusion power. But we are not yet in a, a commercial uh, perspective. Uh, this will come later with demo. The gain factor of ITER should be around 10. That means 500 megawatt of fusion po power will be produced from 50 megawatt of heating power. But the total energy balance of ITER will be negative. That means that uh, ITER will not produce any net uh, energy. Uh, <clears throat> rather, the the, the total power consumption will be negative, according to uh, Stephen Krivit, uh, mi minus 240 megawatt. This has been uh, published in 2022. And this has been confirmed uh, by the ITER organization uh, in a publication, a French uh, <clears throat> magazine in uh, October 2021. So, ITER will not produce net energy and will even more it will consume uh, more energy than it is going to, to produce. Bon, um, this, 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 this can be accepted since ITER is an experiment. Its, it's design has not been uh, conceived uh, for co a commercial application. Well, this, this, this will come later. Uh, <clears throat> wait, a question also uh, that is frequently raised, how much will ITER cost? So you will not find on the ITER website an, esti an estimate of the cost uh, of, of ITER because there is no public, uh, not much, public data uh, on this. Uh, the only source is what the European Commission is paying to ITER. And for the moment, uh, the estimate is 18 billion of euros, as you can see on this slide. So my calculation of the, the cost of ITER based on, on this data is that it is around 45 billion euros. So it will be one of the most expensive experiment, scientific experiment uh, in the world. Uh, and what about the schedule? We, uh, you, you are certainly aware that there are some delays. Uh, the ITER organization will announce uh, in June this year, so in uh, three months time, a new schedule, a new budget, but uh, from internal uh, information, um, there, will, there will be at least five years de delay, additional delay. Voila, I will stop here. Um, just show so the cover of my latest book. Uh, and I will be happy to, um, to answer the question. Um, just for your information, I, I live very close to the ITER site, so I can, I can see the, the site from my garden, and uh, I frequently post uh, photos uh, of the site on uh, my Twitter account. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. And uh, so on we go to our uh, final panelist, uh, Clive. I'll just... Uh, it's Michelle there. 
Uh, Clive Bess has a BSc in physics uh, and a PhD in high energy physics and has worked as a research fellow at CERN uh, for three years, Rutherford Lab for two years, and at the Jet uh, Nuclear Fusion Project as well uh, for five years. Uh, thereafter, he worked at the Joint uh, Research Center in Italy um, and was seconded to the African Union in Addis Ababa um, between November 2007 um, and March 2008. But many of you may be uh, more familiar uh, with him from his uh, uh, prominent climate blog, uh, clivebest.com, uh, which had actually begun as, as a way of charting his experiences uh, in Ethiopia, but uh, you know, moved on to really looking at the physics behind climate change. And he's been a prominent voice in the climate debate uh, for many years. So uh, we're very uh, interested at listening to what he has to say. Uh, well, I'm afraid we are quite short on time, Clive. So uh, I'll be quick, don't worry. And uh, yeah, we'll be going on to, to questions very soon. So do keep, keep those questions coming uh, in the panel as well. Over to you, Clive. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, display this, wait. Okay, um, so uh, I guess um, this talk is about UK fusion research. Um, my knowledge of that really was because I worked at JET um, from 1982 to 1988 which was coincided exactly with the time when the machine was starting up and it was being built and it was being, uh, and we had, I would say we had very good managers in those days um, because we got it, we got it, it, Jet was built on time and the first plasma was um, met, met its target date. So, the designer was a Frenchman called Paul Rabou. He's very, um, he's very well respected. And in fact, uh, he was there in, in Cullen this week, last week. Um, so it was built on time and to budget. And that's also thanks to the first director of JET, which is who people forget about, was who's Hans Otto Wuster, who was a, CERN, he came from CERN. And he, it's his, it's to his credit that he got all the bureaucracy done so well. Um, and as you've probably read in the newspapers, um, JET uh, has broke, now holds the world record for the DT fusion energy uh, in one pulse, which is 69 megajoules. That's about the equivalent of charging a Tesla up for two, and it can travel about 150 miles. So <laughs> that's one, one way to keep it into perspective. Um, but um, so it jet basically achieves its goals. Um, and um, it now, um, the closing ceremony was held last week, last week, actually. And I went to that and it was very interesting to see everyone again. And um, people felt, yeah, I mean, they had, it was a good project to work on. It, the, 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 the atmosphere was positive. Um, Pretty, so pretty well done, yeah. Um, now, as far as UK Cullum, so I'm, this this talk is about the UK now. So I included Jet because it's based in the UK. Um, meanwhile, while Jet was being developed, the Cullum Lab itself was was specialising in something called sp spherical tokamaks. They have some advantages with, with confinement time and and power and so on. Um, they're basically, if you think of jet being a donut, then a spherical tokamak is more like an apple. It has a very th uh, thin core in the middle. Um, and their, their main um, project was called Mega, Mega Ampere Spherical Tokamak, MAST. And uh, this is now um, being upgraded with a, a, with a new diverter to remove excess heat. So one of the problems with tokamaks is that they... The, you've got to get the heat out somehow. You don't want to damage the the, the walls. And um, the one when the plasma touches something, it should touch the diverter, which moves heat and and part and impurities out out of the way. Otherwise, the the the, the pulse can be quenched. 
Um, and as a direct, so as a direct spin-off of that, uh, Hallam are now proposing, and it, it was announced that actually at the uh, at the farewell ceremony by a minister, I think his name is uh, what's his name, is uh, Andrew Bowie. So he's a he was the Department of Energy in Britain, and he has his. Uh, there's this project which has now been approved, which is actually to build a power production spherical tokamak, supposedly, and it will be connected to the national grid, um, supposedly. Um, it's hosted in West Burton, which is a, 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 there's a coal power station in, in uh, West Burton, and they're going to use the site to build the, what they call, the, the step spherical tokamak. Um, and the idea is that it will be developed and built and, and it'll, it'll feed power into the national grid in 2040. Um, so that's what they, they that was what was announced. And it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, in the picture on the right, you can see the, the mass two with its new exhaust being fitted for the, for the reactor conditions. Because of course you've got a huge amount of energy involved, and you do not want to damage the inside wall of the pro of the tokamak because you can any serious damage to the tokamak, and you're out of action for a long time. Um, in a in a similar vein, there was a spin-off company uh, doing on the, exactly the same subject, which is in, based in Didcot, which is just down the road from Cullen, and um, they are. It's called Tokamak Energy PLC, and they're uh, developing uh, spherical tokamak, which using high high temperature superconductors. So they 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 use strong magnetic field, um, and um, they are also proposing a uh, energy develop energy producing prototype, which will be built in Cullum now. So it's a private company, it's a spin off of Cullum, and it's going to be hosted. They've agreed that they can host it in, in Cullum itself. Um, now, the relationship of this to STEP is unclear to me anyway, because they're both, both similar uh, projects. One is a private company, and the other one is a, a publicly funded company from, the, from Cullum. And they're kind of similar. They're trying to do the same thing. So it's still unclear to me. Um, and Cullum is supporting both of them. The... The other interest, so right now in, in the UK, there's quite a flurry of activity in private companies. And this one is particularly interesting. I find this one quite fascinating. It's called First Light Fusion. And it's, it was, it's come out of Oxford University. And they've come up with an a inertial fusion system. Now, recently, uh, Lawrence Livermore achieved ignition um, using focused high power lasers onto a onto a target with filled with deuterium and tritium, and they actually reached a Q of um, above one, about it was about one point five. Q of one point five means that if they, it produced more energy than was put into the the lasers. However, of course, it doesn't really cover the cost of the lasers, but it you know it, 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 in principle it's a Q of greater than one. So the idea of taking uh, deuterium and tritium and then blasting it um, with a projectile is quite attractive because it doesn't, it, you don't, you need much less equipment. And um, First Light Fusion is aiming to achieve this using target. They're not using lasers, they're using a, a they're using a physical target, to, but they're firing, it's like a rail gun and firing, uh, firing um, extreme powered electromagnetic power to launch projectiles at a fusion target. Uh, so machine three is what they're using right now and machine four is what the fusion relevant and they are also going to be building that on the Cullen campus um, so really what has happened is that the political decision has been made to focus everything on, on Cullen's site so that we can see which one wins if, if, if any of them can win but this one has the advantage that it doesn't have all the complexity of the um, tokamak and also by um, you can you can generate uh, power in a, in an easier way, 
So basically, you have uh, what well, they 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 have a show a, a version of this whereby the target is dropping through some lithium because of course you've got to make more tritium. So the, the target's dropping through some lithium. It gets walloped by the uh, by the projectile, and then it, it it produces fusion energy, which a produces it generates more tritium, and b produces a large amount of heat. So it, it's kind of interesting. Um, just a quick slide here on what I think use the US, UK's fusion policy. I mean, it is all political because after Brexit, uh, UK was not really a it was no longer a partner in it directly as because of it previously it was through Euratom, and uh, and Jet is now closed. So it seems that UK policy now seems instead to concentrate everything on Cullen to develop Cullum as an incubator for all the public and private UK fusion efforts. Um, and then kind of, you know, it, it, it makes sense. We have, we have to finally get fusion to work or else we have to stop. Um, so their goal is to, as I said, is in step is to, um, to have a fusion power station connected to the grid by 2040. That's very ambitious. Let's see if they can do that. Um, so, We've had 65, 65 years ago, we had the Zeta fiasco, which was in Harwell. They, 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 they built a machine which is, they thought would do fusion and they detected some neutrons. So they made a press release saying that they'd solved nuclear fusion. Yeah, and it ended up that it was a fiasco because they hadn't at all. But, um, but however, could the UK now itself be, uh, be build the world's first fusion power station? And I personally would hope that they could but um, we'll see. And that is all I need to say. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Clive. Lots uh, to ponder there for, from each of our speakers. So let's get right into it because I know there's a lot of questions uh, and I want to cover perhaps the broadest brush, broadest brush ones first so that we can you know, get to the, to the fundamentals of the debate. So first, I think I'd like to... Um, to ask you all, you know, we heard from from John a bit more of a negative take on 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 you know the advantages or or lack thereof of of, of fusion over fission. Um, so perhaps I could ask each one of you, you know, what has been the the benefits of what we've done so far? What has worked well, and you know, what is the point of continuing uh, uh, with fusion research when you know fission? does do a lot of the things that we want fusion to do. Uh, so, John, do you, want, do you want to start with that? Okay, well, I mean, I clearly, my answer is I don't believe, uh, in, at least in the short term, there is a reason to go on with fusion. I am, I'm a research physicist, so, I mean, I, I definitely uh, support in principle fusion research i mean I, I have all my life and this and other things i mean what i actually did myself is even less connected to reality than than fusion research so i i i certainly believe in fundamental research but i mean this has taken an awful long time um what's actually happened so far is plasma physics i mean the in these tokamaks uh, there have been decades of advances in containing the plasma, but the stage of getting the energy out really hasn't been touched on. I mean, this making uh, tritium, all this stuff is, I think, decades away. And so I, I think for me, uh, it's a question of priorities, uh, how much public money should go into this. I actually have zero problem with private money going to, to this. So I, I see this private research as, as very interesting. I mean, it's not the taxpayer's money. It's just some investors betting on this. So I, I see this as very positive. Uh, I mean, I think I think you should ask Michelle what's going to happen for ITER. But I, I see ITER has got a lot of complications. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know whether... Michel has an opinion what's going to happen in this June ITER meeting, council meeting, but there, there could be objections to the budget. I mean, the budget probably has to increase, 
and uh, I'm not completely sure which countries are going to be in there paying for it. Michelle, do you want to respond to that and, and answer the original question as well? Yeah, <clears throat> presumably uh, the budget will increase <laughs> and um, the members will not be happy, of, of course, about, about this. But uh, the history so far is that the, all the countries re remain uh, very supportive of the project. Uh, they are learning a lot also. The industry is learning a lot. Of course, it's very expensive. It's very complex. It will be delayed and there will be more delays after. But um, we are learning together. And there have been uh, several progresses and achievements recently. Chet has, uh, has uh, a new, achieved a new record uh, for the energy produced during the last experiment. Uh, the NIF in the United States, so this uh, machine using lasers, 192 lasers to uh, heat uh, a small uh, bowl of uh, gas and produce fusion energy. The NIF has achieved for the first time a gain factor greater than one, so producing more energy than the energy injected in the, 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 the machine, the ball. So, <clears throat> and this has, uh, this has made the headlines uh, in the media. Of course, when you look at the data and at the figures, we are still very far from commercial applications. Uh, despite uh, the claims of several projects, like step or so I see uh, that will be connected to the grid by the the, the 40s. Uh, I think we, like John said, we we, we need more decades uh, to, to get there. But the good thing is that there are many projects. There is a we there is a kind of competition, but also stimulation, emulation uh, between all these projects because it's it's a global community. Uh, working on the, on the fusion. So um, this shows also that there is a, a global trust in the, the technology. Huh? People, private companies are putting quite a lot of money, a billion of euros. So, so um, mm, let's see. Huh? We have to, as, as good scientists, to make the experiments, if, even if they are uh, expensive. But at the end, uh, Hopefully there will be a solution. What, what I have said frequently to the main fusion organization, try to be realistic and not like we have said, claiming that fusion energy will be lim a limitless energy. This, this is nonsense. Uh, nothing is limitless uh, uh, on earth. So now um, most of the websites have suppress these, these um, over-optimistic claims uh, because it doesn't help. Uh, and we have to recognize also that fusion energy is not a solution for the climate uh, warming problem now. Clive, do you want to uh, comment on that as well? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, you see, uh, if you want to cut carbon emissions, then, well, you're probably better off building fission power plants. Um, the French have done. The French are going to be uh, carbon zero, basically, and and uh, and the UK is going to um, keep gas because when the wind doesn't blow in winter and there's no sun, uh, you need gas power stations because it's the only thing you can switch on. So if we if we don't build more nuclear power stations in Britain, we're going to end up um, pretending to um, reach carbon zero and when we're not. And it, so I, I think um, as far as fusion goes, I mean, there is always the, I mean, I like to think of this, say this, 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 this company, um, the uh, First Light Fusion, for the, the First Light, um, they, you know, they have, I think there is still a possibility 
unlikely, but it's a possibility of some some maverick of breaking, you know, getting it to work, and, and in a simple way where you can get the heat out quickly. Um, so I, I like I like first light fusion, but I don't know about yeah. I mean the rest is just very complicated. Um, I enjoyed working on jet um, for the, the time I was there, but and um, but uh, yeah, I mean it wasn't it was never going to. Um, I mean it did help define ITER, but it um, yeah, and it, and it did it did it did a good job, but it. Uh, um, you know, it, it, that's what we're talking about. I mean, I was only 20. I can't remember how old I was when I was working on Jet, you know, and now it's still, I'm, we're still talking about it. So, you know, it's a very slow process. Thank you. I'm going to throw in a few questions uh, now and, and people can re respond to the ones that they think uh, uh, they have the best answers to. So uh, first one I'll read is Lembit Opig, who uh, says, my father worked at Harwell and he's always felt fusion is possible eventually, but needs a step change uh, in thinking. Uh, if I'm wrong, how long will uranium reserves last before we need something else um, anyway? We also have Greg Halliwell, who says, with the withdrawal of the UK from Euratom at the same time as Brexit, it looks like the UK has now inherited JET, one of the world's only operational fusion reactors. The machine has achieved fusion for a longer time than any other machine, particularly with the latest run in 2023. Jet thus seems to be a golden goose machine presenting a golden opportunity to continue plasma physics research in the continued operation of the existing jet machine uh, with the with possibly relatively inexpensive uh, upgrades. There's just been the closing ceremony, but are there plans to actually continue the use of this uh, this machine in the UK in the future. Um, and uh, we also have Dion Vaughan, who asks about, you know, other fusion approaches rather than tokamaks. We've touched on that a little bit. Um, but, you know, to what extent do the panellists think that, that competition and perhaps the alternative approaches to project management that that would involve could actually be a driver for 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 the better uh, development of and faster development of fusion in, in the future. Uh, so so uh, shall we go to Michelle first to offer his thoughts on any, on any of those questions? Um, about the, the UK and Jet, um, well, I think it's a political decision taken by the UK uh, to discontinue the cooperation with Euratom as the, the left formally speaking uh, the EU and Euratom and they have decided not to not to re-enter uh, ITER but to concentrate the, the research on, uh, on, on some sites in the UK like Kulam and uh, the STEP project now. Uh, I understand this is a, a political decision. Mm. Of course, jet the jet has been very successful and could could uh, could uh, make some services. But uh, as the machine belongs to uh, both the UK and Euratom, we said it has been decided to 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 stop and close it. Thank you, uh, John. Do you want to come in on any of those questions? Okay, well, I can try and say something about how much uranium there is in the world. I'm not a specialist, but I think uh, what's obvious is that there are very long-term supplies. I mean, some of these, uranium has been exploited. I mean, there are mines, but what's so far been exploited is the rich ore mines, and it's been a, a question of cost. And so if you want to pay more for uranium, there are obviously places in the earth where you can find more uranium. Uh, and then if you're done with the earth, you've got the sea. I mean, every river uh, erodes rocks and the uranium goes into the sea. And so the, the, the sea, the oceans are full of uranium. And there, there, are, there are projects extracting 
uranium from the sea. But because uh, at the present, the cost of mined uranium is relatively low, there's no interest in any commercial, large-scale commercial uh, extracting it from the, the oceans. Uh, but I'm so sorry, exactly how far you can go with all this, I don't know. But I think it's it's a question how much you want to pay. And the other <clears throat> very important issue is reprocessing the fuel. I mean, fuel typically uh, is 5%, 6%, uranium-235, and only a couple of percent gets burnt before it's taken out to replace it. Uh, but you can reprocess this, and you can actually also ex extract the plutonium, so you can uh, you can re-enrich the fuel rods. And this has not been done again because of costs. It's been much cheaper to get it out of the ground. But this is now happening for the first time everywhere around the world. They're now starting to do this. There was uh, just a month ago, one nuclear reactor in France was refueled completely with reprocessed fuel. That's a, a first off. It's never, never before has a complete re refuel done with reprocessed fuel. And I mean, there are plants in the north of France which are expanding dramatically. There's going to be another plant in the south of France also in the US. So reprocessed fuel is definitely coming in. This is also uh, kicked along the line because of the, uh, the the end of desire to import uranium from Russia. <clears throat> and so, I mean, that there are large uranium reserves. I think nobody can put a, uh, a time scale on this, but I think it's it's obviously thousands of years what happens in a hundred thousand years, I'm not sure. I mean, people are fond of saying that fusion is going to keep the world going for hundreds of thousand years. But I mean, as Michelle and I have been saying, I mean, the problem with uh, with fusion is you you may be able to regenerate it once you've got the machine going, but world supplies of tritium feed ITER plus one other fusion machine. After that, you have to make it. And in fact, all the tritium in the world comes from fission reactors. And so the, the most obvious way to have a fusion uh, economy would need uh, a whole fleet of fission reactors producing the fusion. And in the, the, the same fission reactors which are producing the fuel the fusion also produce electricity from the fission. And so there's no obvious reason in that sort of an economy why bother. It's another why not, why bother with fusion? You may as well just take the electricity in, out of uh, the fission reactors and have done with it. Clive, do you want to come in on that or any of the other questions that I read before? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, the it's true about tritium that um, you have to generate it on site from the f fusion reactor. There's no other way. Um, so you have to have a tritium reprocessing uh, plant on, on, on the same side as the, as the tokamak reactor. Um, uh, the, uh, that's why I quite like the first light fusion solution, which is basically to dump, uh, to dump all the energy through, through a water, uh, a, a shower of lithium, which generates for you uh, as part of the um, as part of the deal, uh, some tritium, and it does it in a way that doesn't you know because they don't have a containment vessel. It's just that it, it's a micro H bomb, if you like. It's a simple you you're um, it's that it's like laser fusion. Yeah. Um, uh, Shall I go? I'm afraid we're running very tight on time, but we have got uh, time to just hear from. Uh, Edwin Cartledge, who's a science journalist uh, and uh, is wanting to uh, ask uh, his question. So I'll just go over to him uh, to, to, to ask us, which will be our final question. Uh, and then we'll just hear from our panelists one last time. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, I don't know if there's a video or what's... Um, 
But anyway, no, well, I just thought, um, just to ask each of the three speakers, um, just a rather basic question, but given the different views on fusion, um, how much money should governments be spending on fusion research? Thank you. Uh, Michelle, do you want to come to that first? But the governments are uh, already spending quite a lot of money because uh, all the big countries, the, the, the big economies have at least uh, one fusion reactor uh, in operation and some countries have more than one. This is the case for Germany, for all, all, all the, 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 the big um, uh, countries uh, in the world. Uh, plus we have now uh, 30, 35 uh, private projects uh, injecting also, uh, it was estimated, 6 billion of euros uh, so far. Um, but I don't think it's only a question of money. Huh? Uh, of course, it helps. Uh, it can uh, make things happening uh, faster, but there are also bottlenecks and uh, um, uh, some uh, open questions, uh, like the question of material, the breeding of tritium, etc. So it's it, it's not because we will inject ten times more money that uh, you will get the solution. Huh? So uh, the, the research will take time. Uh, there is a need for research, fundamental research, also uh, on on these issues. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Clive, I think um, one of the problems with is that there's in the in the in the mindset of the public and and, and certain politicians, nuclear fission has got uh, a problem with uh, waste, nuclear waste, and with that, and we have. So, the reason they like fusion is because it it doesn't produce well. It doesn't appear to produce long lived um, radioactive waste. So you know, part of this is political. I mean, if you, if you were sensible. I mean, if I was if I was in charge of the UK's um, energy, I would build um, probably five or six EPRs exactly the same around the coast of Britain, where where we've already got power stations, and then you can you can have a bit of uh, renewable energy if you want, but you've got a core bed, you've got a core reliable set of um, uh, energy sources, but. People like fusion because it doesn't produce long-lived waste. So, and and it's um, in principle, it's an, it, it's the, it's the energy source of the stars, and that the people like that. You know, the sun is a friendly is a friendly um, uh, star as long as you don't get too close to it. And um, so, the, there's in the I think it's part of this thing is political as well. Uh, so, fusion gets the political support because it it seems. It seems too good to be true, and it is too good to be true, unfortunately. Um, but um, the fission had ha got a bad, got a dirty name, partly because of anti-nuclear campaigners, uh, like the th Three Mile Island and so on. So um, there's always been a problem with fission, but it's time to, to re revisit that. I mean, uh, I think John John's absolutely right. Um, the the correct answer is nuclear. Fission. Um, I mean, there's some some large nuclear power stations for Britain, and I just would hope that that goes through. I think there's a sizeable bean. It needs to be um, uh, start building now. Thank you, Clive, and uh, every to you, John, uh, for the final words. Okay. Well, I mean, my my opinion is you can't put a an absolute number on it, but. All countries should be spending a vast amount more on fission than fusion. So let me say uh, the, the fusion budget should be, say, a quarter of the, the public fission budget. Clearly, I mean, fission is has been a mixture of public and private. Of course, now in France, EDF is, is publicly owned. So basically anything nuclear which happens in, in France from now on 
is taxpayers money but i i think uh, i mean i think it's sensible to go on with some amount of money going to fusion but i think what's needed is i mean this materials research which uh, michel has mentioned a few times i i brought it up i mean these you, with the present materials you you have you would have for fusion you have to repair them so often that it just makes no economic sense if you could develop materials which could withstand the neutron damage, then that would be worthwhile for everybody's project. I mean, it's very likely none of these private companies are going into materials research. And even the ETER project, there were plans for a long time of having neutron beams in Japan, and now there's going to be one in Spain, to do some of this materials research and to do some of the tritium breeding research, but that that got put to the bottom of the funding pile. So when I started to look into this, I was I was amazed that this sort of research wasn't becoming given priority. That people were going on to the final step, missing out the middle step, as it were. And so I. I would put public money into materials research, which is the same machine could do your tritium breeding research. So that's what I'd say. Thank you very much, uh, John. And thank you to all our panelists for what's been a really uh, insightful webinar. I think I've learned an awful lot about fusion over the last hour and a half or so. And uh, I'm sure that's all been really helpful to, to our audience uh, who will have learned a lot uh, and this can help contribute to uh, the energy conversation going forward. Uh, and just finally, to to everyone who asked questions, thank you for your questions. If you still, if you didn't have your question answered, uh, but still still want to hear from our panelists, do email me again with that question, uh, and I can share it with our panelists, and, and we can write back to you in due course. But uh, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you all of you to uh, joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, and uh, all the best from, from me and the Net Zero Watch team. Thank you. Thank you.